There is a one in 400 trillion chance in being born. There have been 117 billion people to walk this earth. 3.7 billion of those people were alive in 1969. 3.4 million served on active duty in 1969. Of all those, no more than a thousand were qualified to be an astronaut by NASA standards. 51 astronauts participated in the Apollo program. With all those people and all the odds, only one man can say he was the first to step foot on the moon. Neil Armstrong, the boy from Wapakoneta, Ohio, would be the first man. For a man with cameras seemingly pointed at him most of his life, Armstrong was a mystery to those who knew him, wanted to know him, or have tried to understand him. The quiet, reserved, bookish pilot was not an obvious choice for the honor of being the first man to step foot on the moon. But it was those qualities that got him picked. However, that reserved personality created controversy and conspiracy theories throughout his life. Hello and welcome to Lights, Camera, History. This is our historical review, First Man. We'll see how the man translated into a biographical film that had a controversy of its own. Let's launch this video. The engines are armed. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have put on. The movie is based on a 2005 book by the same name by James Hansen. Armstrong was usually hesitant to do a book about himself. A prior work by Hansen that featured engineering and flight mechanics must have made Armstrong feel at home with him for this project. If you enjoyed this movie, check out the book. It is wonderfully detailed and Hansen brought Armstrong to life, which was not an easy task. I say this because he could be withdrawn, even from his family. Armstrong is a unique person to understand. He was the type of person that had his pilot's license before his driver's license. I don't think he flew his plane to school, though. And an even more arduous task was making First Man into a theatrical movie. Fortunately, Neil's two sons, Mark and Rick, were on the set to be consultants to show the world how they remembered their father. Although the pick for Armstrong to be the first out of the lunar module was made without corruption, the press didn't like him all that much leading up to the launch. Even through his Gemini 8 days, he was a boring interview spoke very plainly and often sounded like he was reading out of a textbook. You can even imagine a collective moan in the press room when NASA accounted that he would be the first out. But this sums up how history has been to Neil Armstrong. He did leave an amazing legacy on aviation. He didn't want to be known as the first man on the moon. He just wanted to be a pilot. First Man stars Ryan Gosling as Neil Armstrong, Claire Foy as Janet Armstrong, Neil's first wife, Jason Clark as Ed White, Kyle Chandler as Chief of the Astronaut Office, Deke Slayton, Corey Stoll as Buzz Aldrin, Christopher Abbott as Dave Scott, who flew with Armstrong on the Gemini 8 mission, and Pablo Schreiber as Jim Lovell. Directed by Damien Chazelle, the movie is made to look like a documentary. Most of the shots are up close and personal. The movie began in 1961. NASA test pilot Neil Armstrong is flying the X-15 rocket-powered space plane when it bounced off the atmosphere. His two-year-old daughter Karen is diagnosed with cancer and soon passes away. Despite not dealing with the trauma at home, Armstrong applies for the Gemini program and is accepted. After training, Armstrong is informed he'll be the commander of Gemini 8 along with co-pilot Dave Scott. However, before the launch, his close friends Charles Bassett and Elliot C were killed in St. Louis when their T-38 crashed. With the launch of Gemini A, Armstrong docks with the Agena target vehicle, but a malfunction causes his craft to spin uncontrollably. Armstrong maintained his composure, troubleshoot some things, and regained control of the flight. Later, White reveals that he'd been selected for the Apollo 1 mission along with Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee. During a launch rehearsal test on January 27, 1967, a fire kills White and the Apollo 1 crew. Armstrong learns the news while representing NASA at the White House. The following year, after Armstrong ejects from the lunar landing research vehicle in an accident that could have killed him, Slayton informs Armstrong that he's been selected to command Apollo 11, which will likely attempt the first lunar landing. As the mission nears, Neil becomes increasingly preoccupied and emotionally distant from his family. Before the launch, Janet confronts Armstrong about the possibility that he might not survive the flight and insists that he explain the risks of the mission to their young son. After telling them about the dangers he faces, Armstrong says goodbye to his family. 
Three days after the launch, Apollo 11 enters lunar orbit. Armstrong and Aldrin undock in the lunar module Eagle and begin the landing. The landing site terrain turns out to be much rougher than expected, forcing Armstrong to take manual control of the spacecraft. He lands Eagle successfully at an alternate site with less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining. After setting foot on the moon, Armstrong utters his famous line, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Later, he drops Karen's bracelet into the Little West crater. With their mission complete, the astronauts return home and are placed in quarantine, where they watch footage of John F. Kennedy's 1962 speech, we choose to go to the moon on television. And Armstrong and Janet share a moment of tenderness. So there are some small details the movie gets wrong and took license with, and some great stuff they get right. Let's start with what they get right. The night before he leaves to go to the launch site, the table scene really happened. It's depicted how Mark and Rick remember it. The Apollo 1 fire is nearly verbatim, the actual recording that happened on that night. Now we gotta get the moon. We can't talk between two or three buildings. Gus Grissom, played by Shea Wingham, is an interesting person in NASA history. Had he not been killed in the fire, he was the odds-on favorite for being the first man on the moon. He checked all the boxes, and the Apollo fire created one of the biggest what-ifs of the space race. It was absolute carelessness that killed the three astronauts. The Gemini 8 incident is portrayed accurately, although it's played out briefly. Hey, look, it's Mark Armstrong. He plays the guy that turned off the talk box connected to Janet Armstrong's house. When Mark told his mother he would be making a cameo as that guy, Janet quipped, I didn't like that guy. It's pretty safe to say, had Armstrong and Scott not made it back, NASA would have been in deep trouble. The Apollo 11 launch and landing. There's a little treat for people who love NASA history. The launch audio is from Jack King, NASA Public Affairs Officer. If you watch the broadcast live, this would have been what you were hearing. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All in time. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. The producers took that right from history. Those master alarms that happened were all too real. They were computer overloads dropping secondary commands. But the way Corey Stoll is in the scene was more dramatic than what Buzz actually did sound like. On the real landing, he sounded bored. Breaking up from dust. Pretty feet, two and a half down. Break shadow. Stand by for 30. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. On back light. And for the landing, that's Charles Duke's actual recording of the landing. We copy you down, Eagle. And speaking of voices, this voice, you hear as Armstrong goes down the ladder, is of legendary astronaut Bruce McCandless. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. He was the first astronaut to fly with a jet pack in space. How awesome is that? And that breathing you hear? The movie powers that recorded Ryan Gosling breathing through a real moon-used Apollo-era helmet for the sound effect. They used Apollo 16 astronaut John Young's helmet. Pretty cool detail. The spoken word song, Whitey on the Moon, didn't come out until after the landing, but it's put in there to show the support for the Apollo program wasn't cut and dry. They spent billions of dollars in today's money when there were massive problems on the home front, not to mention the Vietnam War was in full swing at the height of Apollo. Who are all these people in the breakfast scene, you ask? Well, one, that's real NASA sketch artist Chris Kelly's son, Paul Kelly. And the house that's featured in the movie? The real blueprints of Armstrong's Houston residence was used for the movie. There are some stuff the producers took creative license with. Buzz Aldrin did lobby to be the first man out. 
I see sometimes people hold this against him, but wouldn't you, being so close, being ambitious, working your entire life towards something? What do you expect from him? It was procedure at this point for the commander to stay in the craft. Apollo 11 rewrote those rules. The scene where Buzz says it'll go off like a half kiloton A-bomb if it blows was something somebody said around the astronauts. I haven't figured out who it was, not sure if it was Buzz. But sometimes he rubbed people the wrong way. But Deke Slayton knew one thing about him. He was sometimes too smart for his own good. Apollo 8 Commander Frank Borman once said he was a terrific astronaut. It was Earth he struggled with. So the way Buzz is portrayed is true to his character, but it feels shoehorned in. I couldn't find the exact conversation in the NASA transcript night before they separate, but you can tell Mike Collins was nervous prior to Buzz and Neil leaving the command module. He starts talking more and asking a ton of questions. He knew that if they had not come home with them, he would have been a marked man. Although it's a small detail when Buzz says, contact light happens too late. The light went on before they landed and the fuel. There's some debate about how much fuel they had. During the real Apollo 11 landing, they likely had around 30 seconds of fuel left. Okay, here's the biggest misconception the movie leaves. We found people online asking about this. Neil Armstrong didn't leave a picture of his daughter Karen on the moon. We did find this idea came from a family member saying he hoped he found some sort of closure up there. He did not shed a tear. He did name a crater after her. In Hansen's book, he said that Armstrong took several things up there. In Hansen's book, he said that Armstrong took several things up there, like some medallions and a piece of the Wright brothers' plane. But that is one misfire of how Armstrong is characterized. If you read the NASA transcripts of the mission, he was a pilot on the flight of his life. He was on an adventure. He wouldn't have shed a tear on the moon. And so, with all that in mind, we give the movie a B+. The movie does a great job of providing context as to how the Apollo program was received in 1969. And the emotional journey of Armstrong is accurate to him as a man, although some of the things we see is filmmakers filling in the blanks. The way the movie presents space travel is right on. There was some controversy surrounding First Man. Prior to the movie being released, word got out that the moment when Armstrong planted the flag on the moon was left out. This actually fits better with the narrative of the movie. It was about the emotional journey of Neil Armstrong and not the space race or Cold War. But in case you need it, here is a flag. There's another one, and, and there's another one. I would rather hold the movie accountable for having a Canadian play Neil Armstrong. I guess Canada needs this win. Canada is the brother that lives upstairs that didn't get invited to the party downstairs. In all seriousness, there's always the moon landing was fake controversy surrounding Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong had an unusual way of pouring fuel on this fire. Here's a clip of him giving a very cryptic speak during a 1994 anniversary celebration at the White House. There are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. But this is actually very similar to how he spoke before the landing. It was a tough interview, unusually poor with public speaking. To him, he was trying to be poetic and inspiring. The post-Apollo 11 press conference is right in line with this. He looks uncomfortable, dodgy, and speaks like a textbook. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July but rather one that took place in the last decade. But this is just how he was his entire life. In a few years after the landings, he was the public face of an expedition to Cueva de los Teos in Ecuador. The caves were said to have contained mounds of gold, unusual sculptures, and a metallic library. All this from an ancient and advanced civilization. Did this come from Armstrong seeing or talking to an alien craft on the moon? There are claims that there is missing footage or pictures of this encounter. I haven't seen them. The truth of his motivation is a little more boring. Around the time of his flight, his marriage to Janet was strained by this point, and he would often travel a lot. Buzz Aldrin has also been an interesting case after the landing. He suffered from depression in the 1980s. He was an avid academic and had endless energy. Once his days in space were over, he struggled with his untapped intellect. In this clip that's on the screen, it has Buzz talking about a UFO, but that's all it is. He doesn't know himself. Many of the Apollo astronauts had strange sightings on their journey. 
We'll have a link to the video in the description. All these things are under the unknown category, a mystery for the ages. It's in the eye of the beholder. If they didn't land on the moon, then where did these guys go? Hansen writes about the popular rumor that instead of going to the moon, the three astronauts were taken to Las Vegas to party with strippers. Now that's a rumor that's out of this world. But we do know Buzz has a great right hook. Thanks for watching and remember to like and subscribe or we'll have to scrub your launch.